this is really a field informed tool for employers and program sponsors and other stakeholders that are involved in developing these programs. And it's really focused on highlighting promising practices and tactics from the field around what DEIA looks like across uh, a few different categories. So we have a visual here that offers kind of the three main pieces of our framework. We have employer structure, we have design elements for registered apprenticeship, and then we have partnerships. Um, and Tracy and Leah have already highlighted some of these elements in their remarks, including recruitment, partnership, mentorship, um, but I'll offer some additional examples of things that you'll find in here. We, you know, we chose to structure it this way because as we know, registered apprenticeship is not happening in isolation to an employer, it sits within an employer. And so we started with employer structure to really acknowledge the importance of having an organizational commitment to DEIA. And we looked at two specific considerations here, leadership and staff diversity, um, and an employer's overall readiness and willingness to adopt, drive, and scale meaningful DEIA practices. And I think, Tracy, the example you offered of the Women of Walbeck group fits so nicely into this, You know, creating that space for women to come together and share their feedback and access professional development, but also develop a sense of belonging within the larger context of the employer. Um, I think that's a great way to start to build that organizational diversity and to really support uh, a population of workers, both within apprenticeship and outside of apprenticeship. From there, you know, we layered the registered apprenticeship on top of this, and we have these design considerations grouped into two specific categories. We have apprentice experience and we have program management. And apprentice experience, you know, we really wanted to suss out what those pieces of a program are that sort of shape how an apprentice sees themselves in a program, experiences a program, and develops that sense of belonging. And so we identified recruitment, accessible and representative instruction, quality mentorship and retention services as being those critical elements to focus on to ensure that programs are equitable and accessible to all workers and learners. Um, again, I think Tracy and Leah have offered some fantastic examples of what this work can look like in practice, making sure that we are removing barriers in the recruitment process. Um, that could include removing questions around conviction records, um, offering different opportunities for engaging in assessment that are accessible to different learning styles, um, and then carrying that into the overall instruction and design. So ensuring that our on-the-job training and related technical instruction environments are following ADA guidelines and providing opportunities for active and problem-based learning. From there, you know, we really wanted to elevate mentorship, which we know is a requirement of registered apprenticeship, but such an incredibly important part of developing a program that is truly accessible and supportive of all apprentices. Um, and I, I just have to give a kudos to Amber. I love that she has a goal of being a mentor and I think Amber, you'll be a fantastic mentor. Um, but I think you, you, know, you really articulated that importance of being able to see yourself in your peers and of being in a program that is reflective of who you are um, as well as of the community in which it's operating. And so making sure that we're really engaging mentors that are reflective of the community and investing in those mentors in ways that allow them to meaningfully engage with apprentices is so important to driving accessibility. We also looked at retention services and we looked at this beyond just the idea of supportive services, so things like transportation and childcare, but also looked at retention services as things that help to keep somebody engaged by helping them to understand the value of the apprenticeship in helping them reach their long-term goals. So these are things like career exploration, navigation, helping uh, an apprentice kind of understand the workplace culture and how to navigate challenges that might arise, providing support to remove financial barriers, um, or helping them to build their social capital by facilitating introductions to other apprentices, employers, community partners, all of these things 
you know, we've seen in the field be really effective at helping to enhance an apprentice's overall experience in their training, but also support their persistence and completion. And then we wanted to look a little bit at program management. Um, and so we have three specific things that fall under this bucket. That's livable wages and access to advancement, creating that culture of belonging, and then also leveraging data to support equity practices. Um, and we really try to advocate through this, and, and we're so fortunate to have input from many of our partners on the Innovation Hub around this um, for providing competitive market rate wages and also leveraging apprenticeship as a way to support access to mid and senior level occupations. We looked at developing cultures of belonging as ways of authentically incorporating participant voice, which, you know, Leah just shared some great examples of how WizDOT is doing this. Um, and then also providing regular opportunities for apprentices to reflect on their experiences. Just as important as it is for apprentices to see themselves in a program, it's equally important that they have a voice and feel that they have a voice that's being heard within a program. And then we know that data decision making is so important and data is becoming um, even more important in our workforce broadly, but certainly in registered apprenticeship. And so wanted to offer some recommendations from colleagues in the field around how to leverage data to support equity, how to support continuous assessment and improvement of DEIA practices, and how to be transparent with participants around what data is being gathered and why. Across all of this, our partnerships. Um, and again, I want to give a shout out to Tracy and Leah because they've highlighted so many different ways in which their partners show up in their program design and in their broader work. And as we know, apprenticeship takes a village. No one can do this on their own. So what we've offered throughout the framework are examples for how you can work with your partners to implement these various considerations. Um, these are CBO partners you can work with, your state agencies like Leah at WizDOT, your federal partners, employer partners, education partners. Um, also, we, we call out, you know, working with an apprentice's peer network, making sure that their, their support system is involved in the process. Really looking to the diversity of folks in the community that can help to lift up this program, but more importantly, make sure that anyone who wants to participate in the program has access to the support that they need to be successful within it. You know, I do want to say that this framework isn't a silver bullet for solving DEIA. Um, that's a much bigger challenge ahead of us, but it does offer a starting point for new programs who are just beginning their DEIA journey. And it offers strategy to programs that already exist to help them continuously improve the training that they're offering. And I think one of the goals that we have overall for this framework is that different stakeholders can use this in different ways. So an employer like Walbeck may be able to pick this up and use it as a self-assessment tool to help them improve what they're already doing. A state agency like WizDOT could use this as a vetting tool when working with new employers. And a CBO could use this to think about how they might partner with a program and what resources or services they might be able to offer to apprentices. Was it great here, Vanessa, and having her, you know, just watching her lay out so much of what we're already doing at Wallbeck. So um, that's exciting to see. It gives us a validity and it gives the framework validity because what we are doing works and we see a difference in our numbers and in the culture of our company. Employers want to do the right thing. Oftentimes they don't know what that is or, or what it takes to get there. Uh, perhaps they're doing pieces of the framework Vanessa just talked about. They're doing some the recruitment, recruitment, but they don't know how to do this piece, or um, they don't know how to develop mentoring or what that looks like. And I think this framework, with this framework, they have a real opportunity to reach out to you and to use this as a resource um, and see how the full picture can work. Um, it's it's intentional work. It's putting both feet in. It's saying, I need help. It's saying, let's sit back and evaluate what we're doing as a company.